Good morning, Alaska. We are here today with Jesse Sumner running for House District 10. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself here, Jesse. Yeah, my name is Jesse Sumner, um, lifelong Matsu resident, uh, local home builder. I'm currently on the borough assembly, um, elected in 2018. Um, husband, father of three boys, five, three, and one. Well, actually, my five year old is turning six today. And um, yeah. And uh, what what is where is House District Ten? Um, uh, where where areas of Alaska does that actually cover? Yeah, so um, sort of north of Wasilla, north of Bogart, north of Spruce, uh, up along the parks, Houston, Willow, uh, Talkeetna, Trapper Creek, Squintna. Um, yep. Awesome. Well, today uh, my my name is Bert. I am Politidic, and uh, this is Jen Jesse Sumner running for House District 10 here in Alaska for to become one of our newest legislators. And uh, today we're going to just sit down and we're going to have a little casual one-on-one -on -one chat uh, with you, the folks, the audience out there. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them into the comments. We'll do our best to see about getting them answered after the program is over with today. We do got a full list of questions, and I'm pretty sure by the time we're done with this. Whatever you may have been wanting to ask, we probably already gave you the answer. So hang on out, stay tuned, and keep on watching. All right, Jesse, are you ready to get into this? Yeah, let's start. <laughs> uh, we, we got lots of different questions, lots of different things that are always happening within our legislation uh, here in the state of Alaska, things that affects everybody in our state, mm -hmm. whether it be from the potholes in our roads to our education and uh, just trying to deal with the COVID crisis that we have going on in our state and how it's impacting the businesses and, and the different families and people out there and, and what we can do at, on a legislative level to be able to help make a difference here in Alaska. And uh, so we'll, we'll begin uh, by asking one of the, the really simple questions, why are you running? Well, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of work trying to help candidates win um, in 2018 uh, on election day things looked pretty promising um, we had a majority in the house and the senate of republicans and uh, republican governor and subsequently uh, it's been nothing but a complete disaster i think that we need to um, have the republicans in this state work together and actually address uh, the budget Cut, cut the budget and um, we need to put our our state on a sane fiscal path. So I think I can work towards that. Awesome, awesome. Um, uh, let's just jump right into the questions that I have here for you. Uh, well, again, we're, one of our biggest things that we have going on in our state is the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, recently they just passed the CARES Act uh, here in, in the, to distribute the funds going out to Alaska. We're hearing lawsuits are being filed uh, because they think that what was distributed to going to the small businesses wasn't done properly. Uh, the, the told that the, they need to go into another special session because they didn't perform all of their duties to finish passing the state's capital budget. And uh, we've got different things along the lines of uh, herd immunity we're hearing a lot of discussions out there about that the mask mandate that has been passed by uh, mayor berkowitz in anchorage uh, de declaring that anybody that's in the, in the business their business areas going in and out of businesses must be wearing a mask at all times the statistics and numbers out there we're hearing a lot of conflicting information about uh, should we be wearing a mask shouldn't be we wearing a mask does, is the herd immunity actually beginning to start to take effect now? What are the numbers showing us out there? And then we're also seeing a big push for vote by mail because of COVID that we just can't be able to go into the voting booths and stuff like that. Uh, what's your feelings on, on these different topics involving just the coronavirus and, and what's happening within legislation? Yeah. Yes, I, I know so, I unpacked a lot of into that question there, yeah. but. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that the government has uh, much of a positive role in this. Um, as far as the, the, the things that the government actually has done, mostly reactive. So when they put the, uh, when they shut down everything, 
well, demand was already declining because people were at the time concerned and they were going to moderate their own uh, activity levels uh, as they assessed their risk. The government didn't really add anything to that. In fact, they probably just made the financial situation worse. Um, and so the, I, I, I don't think it's appropriate for the government to take measures where they can cause global problems where people uh, themselves can assess their own risk levels and act accordingly. And so the government can cause global problems. People can moderate their own individual individual risk. Um, so I, uh, as far as the masks mandates go and, and closing down businesses and all of that, that should never have happened. Um, but I think that we would have had a decline a substantial decline in business anyway because of people's uh, perceived risk level. And the most appropriate thing for the government to do is to just make sure everybody has accurate information and let them uh, control their own risk levels. Uh, as far as vote by mail, they, that was attempted uh, here in the Matsu borough. Uh, the assembly did not go that direction. We were able to stop that, so we will have all the precincts open like normal, and uh, it'll just be running a, a normal election. Um, when the borough passed the, the their version of what it was supposed to be this year, I know that they had downshot the actual mail by yeah. voting um, because of all the complications of even trying to get it set up for the November elections. The was uh, statistically or astronomically impossible to be able to accomplish in such a short period. So what did come out of that? What was their final? How, how did they address those that uh, for the comfort levels of dealing with the COVID uh, so that those who don't want to go to the ballot box can still, uh, how, how are they going to be able to vote? So we're going to tell, we're going to send them mailers advertising that they can get an absentee ballot just like they always could. And uh, we'll send absentee ballot request forms out in the mail. Uh, other than that, uh, well, even including that, it, it's the normal election. Uh, yeah, uh, everything is the same. We're just making sure people know that that option about absentee ballots is available should they want to request one. We will not be automatically sending out ballots to every registered voter, which there was a number of security issues and, and whatnot that were involved in that. Now, and I'm sure the audience out there has probably noticed by now that I got a tablet, a pad sitting in front of me and it, and it looks like yeah. I've got lots of questions on it, and I do. <laughs> Um, in these questions, I'm not going to go into any particular order of what is written down here. I'm yeah. just going to hit the, the, what I consider the hot topics. I was topics. just trying to remember the other parts of that because that was kind of a, a lengthy question. Vaccine, uh, no, I don't think we can, uh, we can extend lockdowns and, and all these measures until there's a vaccine. I think that would be um, very inadvisable. I think we need to go back to business as usual. Uh, as much as possible, let people moderate their own risk. Uh, we should reopen the schools like normal um, or, or move to an all remote delivery, but this half and half thing isn't gonna work. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna put you on hold there for just one second. Lift up your arm. Yeah. All right, let me slide this over here. I'm gonna put the microphone a little bit closer to you. I know my vo voice is loud. I'm yeah. just a very loud person Sorry, to begin I'm, with. I am not, I make I'm sure not a very loud out person. Everybody that's watching right now can hear what you have to say. Yep. Um, as far as herd immunity goes, I think we're probably closer than that than most people think. Um, so there was a previous uh, sort of a peak in deaths with this virus that was earlier, and now we're getting what looks like a peak in cases, but I would argue that that's because the testing has inclined the entire time, and um, the peak in actual cases was probably when the peak in deaths occurred and so we're probably on the down slope of this anyhow um yeah any any other part of that question that uh, i think you actually covered what i had sitting yeah. there for <laughs> sorry about those out there in facebook land you can only shut off so many features on the phone and uh without being interrupted you have not missed anything while it went dead there while the darn phone was barking but we are back again and uh, we were covering the, the coronavirus and my last question I think was on the, the mass um, or where, where were we out there on that one? I think uh, oh, 
Uh, all the all the stimulus measures aren't going to work in the long run. I know that the, the CARES Act and all that. Um, people actually have to produce things for there to be a real economy. So uh, we, we shouldn't think that we can just put out stimulus package after stimulus package and expect that everything's going to be okay somehow. So people do need to go back to um, normal. Get back. Get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> get back. Get back to work. <laughs> um, okay. So we've got other issues that are going to be coming up now. Now, now I kind of consider the the coronavirus a softball question to, to lead us into this right here because it's more mm -hmm. or less of what your current opinions are, versus the hard questions of like, we've got early learning, K through 12 education out there. Their their budget this is starting in 2018 was roughly 1.24 billion dollars. That's 1 billion 240 million dollars that we were spending on our K, early education and mm -hmm. K through 12 here in Alaska. This last past year, they just passed in the budget 1.3 billion dollars. That is a uh, 250 million dollars, almost 300 million dollar uh, increase onto the budget compared to what it started out with in 2018. Uh, do you have any ideas or suggestions on how that we could uh, accommodate it? I, I know thanks to the coronavirus, I, I've personally considered that this was a godsend uh, that to us that pushed our school into the 21st century and opened up the doors for virtual classrooms. Um, t tell us what you think, because uh, it is the big budget issue. It's just something that comes up year after year, how much money that we're spending on our K through 12. Statistically, we're somewhere around 47th in the nation for being the worst. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are literally 52nd when it comes, and that's including Puerto Rico and Guam, uh, when, it, when it comes to the education of children being able to read by the age of three. So we are literally the worst in the nation for getting an education at that particular point in time. Um, we have the, the worst statistics for uh, the highest spending. Um, we're currently sitting at, uh, the last time I checked, we were 46 out of 52. And uh, that varies from uh, the day to day, depending on who you actually look at. I've seen that we are actually closer to 48th, depending on, on which uh, news outlet is, is re reporting on the, where we stand in our education. Do you have any suggestions or things that you would like to try to enact if you get elected to, to change that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you, you can't have an honest conversation about cutting the budget without saying how you're going to cut the education budget. And what we need to do is we need to have less centralization, less of that uh, money coming from the state and more coming from local areas. And let them make their decisions on that. Um, and it's not that here in the Matsu, the state is spending an exorbitant amount of money because we're, our, our education costs are actually fairly, a little higher, but fairly close to the average of the rest of the country. But you have places like Pelican where they're spending over eighty thousand dollars of state money per student, per cap, you know, per student. So, if you think about that, if you just gave that eighty thousand dollars to the parents, and then said you were going to charge for the district, do you think there's a single one of them that would say, "Oh yeah, here's eighty thousand dollars, send my kid to this public school"? So I don't, I don't even think we're giving them a, a very good value. <laughs> for the money that's being spent. I don't even think they would think that was a good value. Um, and so if we can't control those kind of expenditures, then we're just going to continue to waste money. And, and by the way, um, it's the PFD that is being taken right now to pay that. So in, in a very real way, we, we are just taking the money from them and giving them a service that they would never pay for. And that, that's exceptionally wasteful. So uh, we're going to have to shift uh, responsibility for education and some other services to the local governments and let them decide how much they want to spend on it. Well, some fun facts for you to, to, to chew on and uh, maybe help expand on here a little bit. Uh, the Anchorage School District came out with the, uh, for, for what, ninth grade through 12th grade and the graduation rates for each grade level. And remarkably enough, uh, it was well known that those in the ninth through the 11th grade didn't do as well as they had done in previous years on the virtual classrooms. 
major majority of the poor, poor reason for this that was given was is because the students were just not showing up to the virtual classrooms and were not doing the work and not participating. Um, but remarkably enough, our seniors proved that uh, it, it can work. And uh, the reason being is, is they had the largest graduation rates in a decade. They had the largest class that had, had ever graduated in the state of Alaska for the last decade. And with the best improvement in scores of overall academics than what they had had in previous years to, to this, proving it for, for the most part that virtual classrooms work. Uh, I know that, uh, that we were all went away for spring break and, uh, and we came back from spring break and said, oh, you're no longer going to school. Less than two weeks later, they were coming out telling us that we are going to a virtual classroom platform. Teachers that had never ever touched this kind of a learning system before in their life mm -hmm. are now having to do on the fly learning. Students that had no clue what was going on are having to do the same thing. After about two, three months of, of the remaining of the school year, the, the two months that we got to use the virtual classroom, we, we started to actually get a hang of it. People were participating in the classes. We were watching students that, that previously had failing grades in the traditional schools were actually now passing their classes. Um, and uh, so, so going into this new school year, I've been told that there's gonna be three hybrid uh, decisions that gotta yeah. be made. We're either going to go to back to normal and everybody goes back to school as if nothing had ever happened and we go right back to being the worst in the nation at the highest cost. Or we do a hybrid of virtual classrooms and traditional schooling where 50% of the students enrolled will be going to class this week at this particular school. The other 50% will be doing virtual classrooms during the, the, that week that those are in school. Mm -hmm. And then the following week, those that were doing the virtual classrooms will now go to the traditional school and those that were in the school will go into the virtual classroom. A very convoluted, uh, sounds to me like it's gonna be a big mess if they do that. What, what's your opinion? Well, I, that sounds like about the worst solution to me, the 50%, um, the two weeks on, two weeks off, or whatever, what have you. That, um, so I, I think that the argument about uh, the seniors and the, the success they had with remote delivery uh, certainly uh, speaks to potentially the, the Molly Hooch decision is no longer valid with technology uh, technological advances and we could have remote delivery in rural areas they get potentially a much better education at a, a lower cost than what we're currently doing with all the district infrastructure and and whatnot and so that that, that is a potential avenue to pursue to reduce the education budget um, I would argue more along the lines of let them figure it out and we'll cut the state spending but uh, that may not be a feasible so <laughs> <laughs> well uh, they definitely would put a fire under their, their yes and, uh, make them act instead of uh, the sitting around and the third option that we didn't discuss yet but is, is what is on the table is going to 100% virtual classrooms like we had been doing up until the end of this previous school year uh, I Unlike uh, we, we've got here in the Matsu Valley, when the, when the school year ended, uh, the Matsu ended on a positive note. They closed down the school right on time for when the school was supposed to be ending for the school year. But ASD, on the other hand, had to extend their school year out a little bit longer. And uh, the, the main reason was, and then that was given, is, is that people don't have the internet connections. They couldn't get in to go do the virtual classrooms. Um, is there any possible suggestions that you might have that if, if we go into this next school year and we do need to do 100% virtual classrooms because the COVID scare is still out there, the, the worries about spreading the infection um, through our students and, and having a, the potentially have the real potential of having our schools closed down because a case shows up in school and we end up having people that ended up testing positive there and having to close the school down to be able to disinfect it again. Um, so we get into the virtual classrooms and, and say go 100% is obviously the brick and mortar schools, we've got a $1.3 billion budget. Yeah. 
three quarters of that budget is going into nothing more than the, the infrastructure and keeping the people behind the scenes paid, not the teachers, the people behind the scenes. Um, th there could be a substantial huge savings by going virtual with all of our classrooms. Just with that savings, is there any s anything you could think of that we might be able to reuse that money for in our education to help make this a successful program? Well, you'd probably have to, uh, if you were going to go that route, you'd have to make sure the rural areas had internet, um, you know. Um, but they can't afford it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well we're, I would argue. The parents, can't, I, afford, the, the, the parents I, can't afford to put internet into their homes for yeah, their kids. So. I, I would argue we can't afford the current expenditures on education statewide. So, um, you know, if we can save money that route, it may be worth making the investment. Um, yeah, I, I do think that we will have normal brick and mortar schools here in the Matsu for quite some time. Um, certainly we've already paid for and are paying for them <laughs> right now, yes, the, all are. those buildings. Uh, and we're gonna be continuing to pay for them for quite some time, the bonding. So, um, a, a, and those services can be delivered at a reasonable cost in the more urbanized areas in Alaska. It's, it's only in the remote areas where it really doesn't make sense to have that model of schooling. Um, now you could make an argument that remote learning would work pretty well everywhere, but um, you know, th the cost that we deliver the service at here is probably not in the category that I would classify as completely unreasonable. I think we're about 13,800 per student in the Matsu. Yeah. Whereas state average is 20 something. 20,000 20, is yeah, the average. Yeah, so, so it certainly uh, is apparent that we are spending considerably amount more per student in some areas and it's not, we're not, not for any better results. Um, we do, we, we, so. we even got a remote school out there that uh, has six students in it that's paying 139,000 per student to be going to this school. Yep. Um, they could be going to Harvard for the, the next few years, each student, and have their tuition paid for 100% for just one year's worth of cost of running that, operating that school. Yeah, yeah, so uh, ev even they don't think that's uh, money well spent, probably if you offered them the money, they wouldn't. <laughs> put it towards the school district, that's for sure. So we can move into, uh, uh, kind of move away from the K through 12 and early education, and then let's jump right into universities of Alaska. Uh, the, yeah. the, just to give a budget outlook of there, in 2018, they had $900 million budget that they had for spending within the state, and this, this is coming off of the, the graphs that uh, was provided by our governor back then when he was presenting the budget to everybody out there and through some negotiations with the president of the university and signing of a contract they had reduced that by 75 million dollars this decrease that they they have given we we're in the second year of it right now so r roughly 50 million dollars has been removed from their budget over the last two years we have one more year underneath this contract of another 25 million our legislators in Juneau are currently talking about uh, increasing their budget. In fact, they gave them money from the CARES Act to do just that this year to, uh, of course, help them fight the, the coronavirus and the, uh, the economic impact that, that that has caused. But that's $900 million or $825 million that we're now giving the university. Uh, isn't the university so technically supposed to be paying for itself? Yeah, it's a land grant university. We ought to cut their budget to zero and they ought to find a way to support themselves with the land that they were granted for that purpose. I can think of no good reason to subsidize the University of Alaska system. Uh, it continues though because they spend a substantial amount of money in Fairbanks, Anchorage, and Juneau. And um, so they have a constituency built around that for their spending. But um, anything we can do to reduce their budget is well worth it. And I'm going to throw one out here that I, I, I may get a cringe yeah. out of you for, but uh, thanks to the, the, the president of the university going down, I believe it's to Wisconsin or someplace like that, he went for an interview and uh, he was trying to, to justify how diverse he is. And he was uh, d displaying about the, the 
the um, roles that he's played within our native organizations here in Alaska and how that makes him extremely diverse. Unfortunately, he was asked to, as soon as he got back, to resign. Um, from, from my understanding, of the, the, from what was broadcasted by the news and, and all the, the leaning organizations out there, the left-leaning organizations, were all saying that he just wasn't woke enough, diverse <laughs> enough for the university anymore, and they wanted to replace him. Um, is it, do, do you think this is, might have an impact on current negotiations? Uh, do you think our legislators are going to try to throw the deal that they currently have on the table out the door and use this as an excuse? Well, the president is no longer there that signed this deal. Um, do, do you think that because they, they are av av uh, actively currently right at this particular moment in time wanting to increase the budget of the university again. Completely ignore the contract, ignore the other 50 or 25 million that's still left to be cut from the budget and they want to re-increase -re increase the budget going to the university. If you were elected, where do you stand on that? No. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, uh, I don't see a reason to negotiate university we have we should not be continuing to subsidize them there is no good reason that we should take money from all Alaskans to subsidize the education of people that at least in theory should be having higher earning power because they got a degree although very few of them do get degrees I from what I understand at least in six years um, but no the university performs very poorly uh, Less than a 33% graduation rate yeah. uh, so on all levels, it, and it goes worse the shorter the term. I can't help but think that if they didn't get, uh, if the state w didn't give them money, they may have to then work harder to attract students to receive the revenues to, to operate, and they may actually have better performance. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, they, they go through a rough transition, but there is absolutely no excuse to subsidize the University of Alaska. I'd say cut 100% of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that would, that would uh, free up close to uh, uh, $800 million dollars right there. Yeah, that there you go. Ball. There you go. I don't know if we get there, but uh, that's, no, that's my opinion. <laughs> uh, what, one of the big discussions recently this last past year, the year before, is adding a cap into the budget. Yeah. And, and I bring up the cap into the budget because the last time that they had talked about it, it was uh, the bill was called SB 104, I believe. And in that bill, they had made mention that, that they are wanting to put our statutory PFD and the amount of money that we get underneath that cap. Now, to explain just a little bit so that we're both on the same page by what they mean by this is, is, is let's say they pass the state and capital budget and they put the cap at $6 billion. And the state and capital budget that they pass is $5 billion. If the PFD permanent fund is put underneath this cap, that only leaves $1 billion to be able to pay out the permanent fund dividend with, which means we'll get approximately a $1,000 PFD again. Mm -hmm. What is the, and, and if they did pass this cap written that way, there is nothing there to stop them to say that our budget is $6 billion which is the $6 billion where their cap is at, which means that there is nothing to pay our permanent fund dividend. If we were to have a spending cap, and here's the question, if we were to have a spending cap, would you want to have our permanent fund dividend within that cap or leave it as is the, the fall of the statutes that are already on the books and it is separate from the budget and it's just a transfer from the ERA to be distributed to all Alaskans. Right, so I don't think it should have ever been in the budget and subject to appropriation the way it is. Um, I would rather see it not in a constitutional budget cap, but I think having a constitutional budget cap is so important that if that's the only way to do it, then I would still support that. Um, and the reason is because it's the spending that is the tax. Uh, one way or another, over a long enough time period, the amount of revenue the state takes in is gonna balance with their expenditures. So if we cannot control the spending, the expenditures of the state of Alaska, 
they ultimately are going to spend every dollar of that earnings reserve account. There will be no more permanent fund dividend and there will be taxes. So I, I think it's important enough that we have a constitutional budget cap that you, you would probably include the dividend in that if that's the only way it goes. But that being said, I'd rather have it out if that's possible. But if we do not have that spending cap, then on the road we are on right now, there will be no more dividend and there will be taxes, income tax, sales tax, what have you. And that I think is what we need to avoid. And we could fight and let the Democrats run the show, but they're just gonna get us there faster, so. So, uh, so along the lines of the spending cap here, uh, and because it's, it's part of the big part of the subject, we got our statutory PFD law that has been there for yes. decades now. Yep. We have the new law that has not eliminated the statutory PFD law, which is SB 26, the percentage, uh, percentage of market value where they're taking an extra percentage of, of the, our earnings reserve to pay for government services. Yep. And then we have uh, new laws that they are trying to get passed, which are HB 300 and 306, which has all been, com the, these two different bills got combined into HB 306, which is what the bicameral PFD work group came out with last year, which gives the six plans that they have for spending our PFD. These six plans that they have currently sitting in front of us, not a single one of them does any sort of inflation proofing for yeah. the permanent fund. Um, it assumes that they will take a larger per percentage of market value from the permanent fund every year to be able to cover government services and, and that they are providing out there or lack of services that they're providing. And then uh, they have HCR 13, which is a resolution to basically make the, uh, the, the, this a permanent solution to how they're gonna be able to pay for the budgets from here on out. And the reason why I bring these particular bu budgets or these bills up and why they're so important to know about is under currently under SB 26, they're using that law to justify why they only give us a small PFD every single year instead of our statutory PFD saying that SB 26 has put a, what they classify the cap on the budget of what they're allowed to spend every year. And they cannot exceed that cap. If you ask our legislators that are currently in Juno, this is what they claim SB 26 has done and why the, our permanent fund is not able to be our statutory amount even though they still have the laws on the books talking about the statutory PFD and they're still there. They're supposed to be following them, but they don't follow the law. And then versus the SB 26, how they are been using this to control how things get paid within Juno. Yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear that under SB 26, there will be no more permanent fund dividend pretty soon because the government is gonna grow to uh, consume all of that money and uh, if we don't go back to having some sort of uh, back to as close to the statutory PFD as we can get where that money is not available for government spending then they are going to spend it all and there's going to be no more permanent fund dividend so that's we should probably repeal it and go back to the statutory calculation. I don't know that we can do that with the Wilikowski decision. It would have to be uh, probably a constitutional amendment to keep that out of reach of the legislature. The, for, for permanency, yes, it would have yeah. to be under uh, for the underneath the Constitution. As for repealing SB 26, that is going to be the will of the legislators sitting down and repealing it, just like SB 91 and getting rid of that horrible crime bill laws that we had sitting there. This is no different, SB 26, it's gotta have the will of the legislators yeah. to, to make that change. And, and voters like me going after the legislators that are out there right now to get these laws changed. Yeah, but to be clear, there, there is no free lunch. So whatever government services we are providing, the state is providing, people, somebody is going to pay for them. It's either money that 
was taxed, is being taxed, or will be taxed. And if we cannot cut the budget, then we're going to be paying for the budget. And it's going to be one way or another. And so that's why it's so important that we actually get real budget cuts. Um, and right now, they are taking it. Uh, basically, it's a head tax from the permanent fund dividend. And um, you can expect that if we continue to allow the state government to grow, it'll be more and more tax. And eventually, it'll be an income tax and sales tax and all of that. So if, if we want to secure the permanent fund dividend, if we want to avoid income tax and sales tax and what have you, uh, to continue the wasteful spending, uh, you know, that would just continue the wasteful spending the state engages in, then we actually need to cut that operating budget. And that's the, that's the only way. And it's going to mean more local taxes, too, by the way. Because not all of those services, when you cut them, are going to go away. There's going to be services that people still want. But we need those to be provided at a local level where there's more accountability. And so I'm not saying that there's any solution where there's a magic money tree and, and things are going to be free or, or anything like that, but we, we need those decisions to be made on a more local level where there's more accountability. So, so that kind of brings a kind of segue into one of the questions that I have here about taxes. Um, recently, they, they, they've talked about head tax for education. Uh, one of the biggest ones that I, I've seen out there is the Senate Bill 115, which is doubling of the motor fuel tax. When they went back in to do the final talks on the CARES Act, when they all flew back to Juneau here recently to uh, sit there for a couple of days, this particular bill was re-put back onto the docket to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunate for us Alaskans, it did not get heard this time around because the will of the people, they knew that if they went down there and passed the CARES Act and at the same time passed the bill that would have doubled our fuel tax, there would have been heads rolling at election time and they're trying to avoid that. Same reason that they're also been hinting about wanting to go back to Juneau to deal with the, the, the capital budget that they didn't quite finish up. And at the same time, uh, possibility of, of giving us another permanent fund dividend as a stimulus. Uh, and, and I personally see this as nothing more than a maneuver to try to be able to buy themselves favoritism and, and votes when it comes to the August and November elections. Um, so when it comes to new taxes, uh, are you ready to start instilling them or uh, would you like to see budget cuts first? Where do you stand? I mean, we Alaskans are already hurting financially yeah. and then. We don't have, the state doesn't have a revenue problem. They've got a spending problem. We shouldn't allow the state access to new revenues and, and certainly not at all unless there is some sort of, uh, or unless there is a constitutional budget cap. Because uh, it, any, any new revenue you give the state is just going to grow government. And that's the opposite of the direction we want to go. Um, that being said, uh, the fuel tax is not the worst thing in the world. I mean, if you were talking about the, what, what, what kind of taxes are, are bad and what kind of taxes are less bad, uh, anything that's closer to a user fee for the service is going to be more more efficient. So, if you if you set up a toll, I don't know what I'm saying you should do this, but if you set up a toll booth on the Glen Highway, you could easily recoup the cost of maintaining the Glen and and all the associated costs because it provides more value than than the cost to to the people. But um, and so the, the motor fuel tax, I mean, that's kind of like setting up a toll booth because it's the, the money from, from driving. Uh, I don't think that we should give the government access to new revenue, but um, it would certainly be worse or better than an income tax because um, the, really the last dollar that should ever be taxed is the dollar that's earned. Um, yeah. It's, it's not the worst tax, but I don't see any reason to offer up new taxes. That's not the, the issue is the spending. Um, so 
So we'll throw you a couple softball questions yeah. here. Uh, you can give give you a break in there. And that's uh, and, and I just like <laughs> to say I when 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 I when I say these things, it's not I'm not saying them because I support taxes. I am about the last person that would ever support uh, any tax. I'm just saying that uh, on a hierarchy of what tax is the worst, the the motor fuel tax is not the worst. Uh, income tax is the worst, in my opinion. Yeah, the, the taxing of children every single year by stealing their, uh, taking their PFDs. Yeah, that one might be pretty bad too. <laughs> that's that's so pretty bad that, too. That is a tax. That's a it's a head tax right there. Yes. Yeah. Um, two softball questions for you, and I say like, say they're 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 softball questions because just about every conservative you know what their answers are going to be. Gun rights. Yep, uh, fully in support that everyone should have the right to bear arms unless you're a convicted, convicted felon. Um, you know, I uh, had a member of my family that uh, actually had to use lethal force to defend their life, so I'm very much in support of that. And uh, right to life, abortions. So we need to do everything we can to reduce the number of abortions in this state. Um, with the end goal of zero. And so anything we can do that makes prog positive progress towards lowering the amount of abortions in this state is something that we should and must do. Um, I think there's the, the heartbeat bill would be a good start. Um, we gotta pass the things that we can pass when we can pass them. Sometimes you can run the ball though all the way down the field. Ha and hasn't uh, 21 states already passed the heartbeat bill, but every time it gets presented in front of the Supreme Court, it gets completely thrown out yeah. and says it's unconstitutional. And Jeff Lamfield said I was loose for saying this, but uh, Ruth Gader Bins Ginsburg will not be on the Supreme Court forever and there may be a, a change in and in court, uh, the court opinion on that. So you know, we can be prepared for that day and yeah. Gee, just think we're only just through page one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, I think we covered the taxes, head taxes, SB1 uh, motor fuel tax, uh, but that kind of brings us into the, 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 the question of revenue. The, the, the state is not in the business to make money. The, the state yeah. is in the business of collecting the money. And uh, we're one of the richest states in the world um, and one of the richest states in the United States for our resources. Mm -hmm. And we got mining, timber, we've got some of the most rare earth metals sitting underneath the ground right now just waiting to be utilized. Uh, we have one of the largest fishing environments that you could ever ask for. And our oil, of course, is, is what makes our economy here run. And uh, the last resource, which it seems to always be overlooked because it seems that they want to call this revenue versus what it's not, it, it's actual resource for us, is our permanent fund dividend. Um, so when it comes to resources, well, what do you think should be happening out there, especially for like the mining, the timber? Um, fishing is, is I'll, I'll put it simply for you right now, Fishing is beat to death. We hear about fishing all day long. We know the story about that. Uh, fishing is, is a large part of our economy, but it's not what's paying our bills. And, uh, but, and, and, and it's not an expanding business. It's a business that's pretty much been set in stone for a long time now. But uh, and, uh, and oil, of course, we're going into the Green New Deal. Uh, the yes, yes, I think I'd get a chuckle out of that one. Uh, the, the Green New Deal, and uh, so, so basically we're, we're moving further and further away from fossil fuels out there, and that's our main revenue here in Alaska. Um, what are your feelings towards getting our mining expanded, opening up our forests like in the Tongass National Forest, uh, getting, getting that opened up? Um, the, the, all of these things, when I bring up resources, is, is how it generates the one resource that every Alaskan gets to benefit from, which is our permanent fund dividend. Mm -hmm. They all, no matter what the resource is, every single one of them puts a small share of that money that they bring in every year goes into that permanent fund, fund account for us all. Oh. So expand on it for me. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, and and keep in mind there there's a whole private economy beyond the state. I mean, we should not only be concerned with how these things impact the state budget. We should be concerned with how these create opportunity in the private sector, which is actually the more important thing. 
believe it or not, then, <laughs> then uh, you know. The well, how, how name me a, a good example of uh, how it impacts the private sector. I mean, yeah, you, you can well, give it's a real uh, obvious answer. Yeah, I mean, there, every one of these projects that actually gets done is jobs. I mean, and uh, even if it didn't give a dime of of revenue to the state, that's real income for real people in Alaska, which is really what matters. I mean, even if there was zero state government, you know, if you only had local governments, then people would still, you know, be able to persist. And it's, the, the, it's not that the only thing that's important is the state and that we should not take the look of um, we need to pursue these things because we need state more state revenue necessarily. <laughs> but so that, 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 that has always upset me when people come at it from that angle. But um, that being said, uh, yeah, uh, we need to reduce time to permit for, for mining operations and timber and, and all of that. It should not take a decade to, to do anything in the state. And um, I, I think that we have vast resources that we could uh, exploit. And they're going to be, uh, these resources are going to be harvested somewhere in the world. We would do it more uh, environmentally um, what's what's the word safe sound. <laughs> sound. sound yeah soundly here then they're gonna do it in like uh, Papua New Guinea or someplace in Africa or wherever where they're Russia. gonna completely destroy the uh, <laughs> environment uh, this whole Green New Deal and whatnot is just an excuse to to do these things other places where they do them far less uh, environmentally uh, sound um, nothing is going to replace oil on on any kind of time scale other than potentially nuclear power, but uh, everyone's worried about that. So, uh, solar power and, and, and wind and, and all that. Technically, if we were to, to, to take the entire world <coughs> and, and not just the United States, but the entire world, and we were to go nuclear, there is only enough to last for the next hundred years before they do, do completely deplete the the resource of the nuclear power that we have out there. Oh, well, that's yeah. certainly untrue. There's plenty of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, plenty of uranium and, and thorium to be had. Uh, yeah. Well, norm, known market <laughs> supplies, that's about all they would be able to, uh, oh, if the entire well. world was, uh, the entire world, not just uh, uh. <laughs> the United States. If we were to do the United States, we'd be able to, to power the entire United States for the next 2,000 years, without a question. Yeah. Um, j just to give you where my re reference comes from there. <laughs> Uh, now the fun one. Um, we are going into a political cycle, mm -hmm. and we know how each side, not not particularly just one side, but all sides, like to, to start their smear campaigns. They begin to take their little snippets of something you may have said, it may have said in the past, or an incident that may have happened in, in your past that, that they're going to bring forward, and they're going to try to turn it into something that it's not. One of those things is having a criminal record. And uh, I know the questions, and, and the reason why I bring this up is, is we had uh, John Francis, who was running for office, into a, a seat uh, that, that is appointed by the governor and has to go through the vetting process. And uh, they, they had two issues on him. One of them is, is that he run a, ran a go ghost hunter show, um, proving that ghosts are real in, in the world, and uh, he... He was out there doing that, but that's not the main reason why he didn't get the job. Uh -huh. It happened to be his criminal record. And I know yourself as a candidate, you're required to fill out forms to, to, as you're running for a candidate to disclose any sort of criminal records that you may have had. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, they, for the federal record, it's 10 years, anything that's occurred within the last 10 years. If it's a misdemeanor, it's anything within the last five years. And I bring up John Francis for a reason is because his current criminal record was 37 years ago, uh, approximately 37 years ago. I mean, uh, longer than anything that had ever been listed there. In those 37 years since that one criminal mishap had happened, he had never been in, in trouble with the law since then. Mm -hmm. But because of that, he lost his job. And because he didn't openly come out and disclose it, it cost him the, the, the chance to be able to be in that job. So here's your chance. Yeah. Let the public know. Do you have anything in your past or in your, your uh, criminal history? Uh, are are you a bank robber? Um, you know, uh, what what is there out there that we should know about so that way, m mainstream media and uh, the 
the, those who like to create smear campaigns can't use it against you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I had a DUI when I was, I think, 24 or some, somewhere around that age. Um, just the one, and uh, I certainly learned my lesson. I, uh, it's never even worth the, the risk. You know, I didn't think I was inebriated, and I was pulled over for having studded tires on in July <laughs> or something along those lines. But, you know, uh, I, I've never since uh, repeated that because I, I realized that even the, the potential risk of, of that is not worth um, ever engaging in that risk. Um, yeah, but no, not robbed any banks or committed any felonies, anything along those lines. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I'll throw the I got other some one. speeding tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, I, speeding tickets are uh, are definitely, uh, yeah. but they don't. They buy it paid. They just don't count unless they create a misdemeanor, not just the fine. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then I'm gonna throw the one more out there, and uh, even though I already know the answer, the folks out there don't know the answer to this, is, is, is uh, do you have any Me Too's in, you, in your past? That, that the movement out there has been taking out legislators left and right over the last few years. Just here in Alaska, we've had Rep Dean Westlakes uh, for harassment. We've had uh, Zach Franzler, um, who, who beat up a, a young lady and uh, a lot of rough, things had occurred there that uh, made the news and uh, the the more recent one that came up after that uh, is the suspected the reasonings for why Lieutenant Governor Byron Mallett had resigned um, that just came out this last year in the letters uh, saying uh, bringing up the his, his particular it could have been a Me Too movement that had cost him his job um, yet it has also been reused on the reverse cycle to where we've also had legislators that have been accused of, of having a Me Too moment, but the legislators in Juneau hide this information when it comes expediently to their advantage. And then when it's not, uh, when it's to their advantage to get rid of someone that does not consider them a player and following the agenda that they have in play, they use this to try to get rid of them. Um, David Wilson went through a, a big thing last year, a couple years ago. It was uh, for what they classified as an upskirting with his, his phone, um, trying to listen in on someone else. The reality it was is that they had the tape um, that, that was done on the Capitol that of all the recordings of, of what happens inside the legislative halls there. And they had a tape proving that, the, that this had never happened. And, uh, but we got legislators like Bryce Edgman, Chris Tuck, uh, Kawasaki, Gabrielle LaDukes, Ivan Spinanzal, and uh, the, the, the list is endless of those who have either done their utmost to completely bury them. In the case of Rep. Uh, Deans Westlakes, they had known about his harassment and issues that were there. They had already had the complaints filed with them, but they kept it buried until the, the press got a hold of it. Franzler, he, he lasted a couple months doing the same thing. They kept that buried until the news press got a hold of it. The victim went to the press and brought that forward. And Lieutenant Governor Brian Mallett, they, he just outright resigned and they didn't give no reason why he was resigning. He was just leaving. Those of us who are, are like myself, I, I know the entire I heard story of, of <laughs> I, I know the entire story of why he resigned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because of disclosure purposes, I am not allowed to express my knowledge of how I gained this or, or why I know about it. But I know people that were personally involved that were in the room mm -hmm. the night before his resignation hit the table, and why he was forced to resign by Alaskans or information was gonna be coming out about that particular incident and uh, what had occurred in that behind closed door meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so to, just to be, to, to be perfectly clear here, do you have anything along the lines that you would classify? I, I only bring this up because you're a construction worker. And yeah, the, we, so we, I, I don't we, think any of my employees that. think I've been sexually harassing them. I, I would very much doubt it, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, but um, I'm sure I've said things in my life because uh, I've never been careful, never been somebody that always wanted to uh, you know, run for political office or even somebody that thought they ever would. Uh, I'm sure I've offended people before, but uh, have I ever 
said or done anything so horrible that it, uh, it would be, I mean, not, no. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah, yeah, my, my uh, list is pretty uh, extensive here, isn't it? I I'm, I'm sure the there's some page. snowflakes that you know I've upset in the past, and uh, <laughs> so, but nothing I would be ashamed of, I don't think. <laughs> no, no skeletons in the closet to come out and, and, and uh, rebound on chances up here in the future. Um, we were talking earlier about the the mining and things like that, yeah. and one of the biggest uh, things that we have that we're battling here as an estate, and uh, I know here just last year, Governor Mike Dunleavy spoke out about it. We've had President uh, Donald Trump had come out about it openly. We have Dan Sullivan on a regular basis who also is rallying against this, which is the roadless rule. It, yeah. uh, and, we got a place in King Cove that uh, has lost many people because they won't let them build a road there to, to be able to get medical help when they need it. They gotta wait on medical fly-ins to be able to pick them up and pray the weather is good enough to be able to get and save someone who's having a heart attack that needs that immediate help now. Uh, they, they had gotten approval there at one point. They were gonna be doing a land swap. They were gonna have this road built and then our federal government stepped back into the middle of it again. The other 49 states that don't even live here all declared, well, you guys just can't decide where, you're allowed, where you are allowed to build your own roads. And uh, so, so where do you stand on the roadless rule? I mean, like for our, our mining, or not necessarily mining, but uh, our timber production in the, in the Tongass Forest depends on some of the rules of the restrictions that are within the roadless rule to be lifted from our state. Should the control of where and how our roads built come back to Alaska? Or is, is there anything that you may wanna try to help to facilitate it so that we gain control back over our, our actual being able, to, our, our state, um, to be able to say what we can and can't do? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it, completely ridiculous. Uh, we're being treated by, like a park or something by uh, the federal government and by environmentalists down south. Um, but yeah, m even more than uh, getting rid of the roadless rule, um, there ought to not be so much land owned by the federal government in the state of Alaska. Uh, if there is a way we could address that, I would be very much for it. Um, honestly, that there, there should be more land in private hands in Alaska and less I mean, the vast majority of the land. So, so how much land in Alaska is owned by private individuals? And we're not talking federal, state, or our, our native uh, uh, people that own the lands here in Alaska. Just oh, in not, not the native corporations either? private hands, just in private hands I think hands it's in less Alaska. than 2%. <laughs> Keep going. Is it 1% one, 1 or less? It is yeah. less than 1% of yeah, our land. It's is pretty ridiculous. private, private hands. <laughs> And uh, the, the, the native corporations in Alaska is, is roughly around 20%. Uh, the state of Alaska owns around 30%, and the federal government owns the rest, and yeah. uh, which is why we don't have anything. Um, but when it comes to the resources and stuff like that in the state, we Alaskans, all of us own it, and the government gets what we allowed them to have. And uh, unfortunately, the way it's been over the last years is, is, is government thinks they are the ones in control of it, and us Alaskans got to pow tow down to them to, to decide what we get yeah. left afterwards. Uh, one of the big issues that I've seen in Juneau on a, on a consistent basis is you see them go to go up and give a vote. And just before they, they go to vote on a particular bill, they list their conflicts of uh, of information that they have out there because of who they've worked for, family members who they work for. Like uh, the Senator Natasha Von Imhoff, I like to bring her up as, as the prime example of what you would classify as a legislator with conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, her family owns the Ramsmithson Foundation. Uh, they are very, very much involved in all of the nonprofits. She sits as the chair in the Senate committee on the finance committees that's dictating who and which ones of these organizations are going to be receiving state money and federal money every single year. And her family directly benefits from it. She actively goes out and can't 
campaigns and talks about her family's uh, profit uh, organization and how the permanent fund dividend is needed to be able to make sure they stay well funded as one of her top priorities and ski trails and mm. coastal trails and all this at parks. These things are, are more deserving of our permanent fund dividend and why they got to steal it for the state's budget than to be able to divvy it out to Alaskans. If you were elected into office, are we going to expect to find that you have conflicts of interest that are going to be benefiting or profiting off of your vote of yes? I sincerely doubt it. I'm trying to think of a conflict. Of, I, I, I just build houses uh, and sell them to private individuals. I, I don't think that I receive any money from the state, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, as would, far as- Do you have family members that would benefit, uh, like in the medical field and, and stuff like that, or mining? Because um, I, I do hear them all the time. A legislator will stand up and says, my brother-in-law owns X amount into this mining industry, and I want to uh, emphasize that I've got a conflict of interest because I've got a, a, a economical uh, uh, advantage to, to wanting to make sure this bill passed. Is, can I vote? And then everybody, uh, it, and I've yet to ever hear them say, no, you can't vote yeah. because of your conflict of interest. My mom owns some oil wells, but they're in New Mexico, and uh, uh, my parents live, you know, I, 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 I find it hard to think of any, any, <laughs> any conflict I have that involves the state's expenditures or, or the state laws. The only, the only actual branch of the state government that uh, I interact with is probably DNR for recordings of sales, um, which when they shut down the government, that's kind of annoying because it delays my closings, but you know, uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Other so than that, I'd rather not see the state uh, ever. So <laughs> you know, for, I mean, there's, uh, there's no other part of the state that I uh, uh, interact with or want to interact with, really, uh, as far as my business goes. Uh, AHFC, I guess uh, there used to be a good amount of those loans for buyers, but I haven't seen any in quite some time. So it's almost all like Wells Fargo now and uh, Alaska USA. And so you're, you're so not, the, the, just by what you're describing there, your line of business doesn't, isn't going to create you yeah. any conflicts to begin with. Um, I, I, I can't think of any. <laughs> and no, nobody's in the medical field in my family or anything. Well, my, my sister takes eyeballs out of people, uh, <laughs> out of cadavers, though. <laughs> but that's down south, too. Uh, yeah. So we're, I'm gonna, we've got just a, a <laughs> few more handful of questions here. Um, every year we, we've been hearing about the illegal binding caucuses yep. uh, that we have in Juneau, both in the House and the Senate. Basically it's handing control over to 10, 10 or so legislators, 10 or 15 legislators that say this is what we're gonna make sure gets put into these bills. We don't care what any of you other legislators put in there. We're gonna agree to them up front just to keep you happy and slide them into these bills. Then the binding caucus, when it becomes the House and the Senate in a joint committee to, to finalize the final details on the final version of the bill, those in control of the caucus go and sit inside of a room, and I'm gonna use our permanent fund dividend as the, the, the example this year, is, is that they had originally given us a $1,000 stimulus of the 1300 they had taken from us last year and they said we're going to give you a thousand dollars for this year's pfd which we just saw here on the first of january or july here when they got the final version the both the house and the senate sat down in that room to discuss the uh senate bill or uh, house bill 205 our state and capital budget putting the final details on it and i'm going to bring up the same legislator that uh, i just spoke about here just a second, a second ago senator natasha von inhoff was uh, one of the people inside of this room who was a part of the binding caucus and uh, and she's been a staunch advocate i mean even when they did pass that the thousand dollar stimulus she demanded a revote on that because she didn't realize that they had voted to actually give the stimulus that, that in her mind they had made the mistake and they need to correct that mistake right then but she couldn't get the the, the legislators to re-vote it back out again after it had already passed 
So they did it the next best way. They waited until it got into the final version with the House and the, the Senate yeah. committees that joined together, and they stripped that stimulus right back out of there again. Um, we've got several things out there that they use for blackmail and that are extortion or what I, that I classify as the different means of being able to get people to vote. And one of those things is using what they class, call the uh, binding caucus. And from everything that is coming out, uh, Senator Mike Schauer has been doing a very, very thorough study. He has come out on, on almost an every other week basis uh, since the beginning, talking about the binding caucuses, uh, what he has discovered in the, the rest of the United States. Do you, did you know that <coughs> we are the only place in the United States that has a binding caucus running yep. our government? And uh, so the, the reason why I bring up this binding caucus is, is because we get these certain legislators that are controlling how people vote. You sign into the binding caucus and your name gets added onto the list that when the House bill or the, the final state and capital budget gets presented on the floor, you've already sold your vote to be a yes, no matter what is in that bill. So you, let's pretend you were the guy, the one of the ones that was sitting there in the Senate. You had approved that thousand dollar stimulus. You had approved that thousand dollar <coughs> PFD. But when it came out of the the final committee between the two, it was now gone. Your constituents voted you in the office to protect their PFD. Mm -hmm. And now that uh, because you sold your vote to the binding caucus. Now that it's gone out of there, you still have to vote yes. This vote goes 100% against what your constituents, the Alaskans you represent, have asked you to do. If you get voted in the office, are you going to join a binding caucus? So Whether, whether it be Democrat or Republican right. control. <laughs> and, and there is a difference between a binding caucus and a regular caucus. Yep. We, me and you could caucus on an issue that we both agree upon and we're gonna work jointly together to get this bill to pass and we're gonna try to convince as many other people yep. out there. But if I was to strip out what you caucused with me on this bill, you don't still have to vote yes with me if it got stripped away. Yeah. That, that, that's the difference between a binding caucus and a regular caucus. Yeah, so what we need is a Republican majority caucus. That's not a binding caucus. That's a team of people that says, we have these common goals and we're going to try to work together to get there. But the binding caucus rule says, or it, I, I would argue is already illegal. So if you are taking your vote and you are effectively selling it, for something of value, which, you know, a committee chair or a better parking spot, a better office or this or that, you're committing an illegal act. The person that's making the offer is committing an illegal act. Actually, under state statute, not reporting it would be an illegal act. And then when, when you go and you vote, you know, the way your constituents want and they, you're stripped of those things or the threat is made, that's extortion. So that, that is illegal. I would not say I will vote however you want in exchange for a committee chair, or I will vote however you want in exchange for this or that or the, you know, the other thing, because that, that, that is a, and, you know, that shouldn't happen. Um, now that's not to say that you have a caucus get together and they say we want to cut half a billion dollars out of the budget, out of the operating budget, you know, we're going to get there one way or another. Um, and I might say, if, if you, we get together a budget that has a half, mil, a half a billion dollars out of it, I'll probably support that, you know? And so, I mean, you're going to need to pass a budget at some point in time. I'm not going to guarantee, no matter what is in a budget, that I'm going to vote for it a, a priori. That's, that's insane. But that's what they are currently doing right, right now, isn't it? Yeah, but um, you know, we we are going to need to bring the Republicans uh, all to the table around a common goal, which is going to need to be cutting the state's operating budget, and that's the only way that it's going to happen. Uh, no, I wouldn't sell my vote or anything along those lines. 
I actually would go to jail if I did that on the assembly and probably ought to on the in the legislature too so we got just a couple more here and then we're gonna call it quits uh, with all the current issues that we got going on in the state uh, around the world around the United States we've got uh, black lives matters we got all lives matters we've got the thin blue line we've got statues being destroyed and ripped out uh, We've got currently here in this state uh, them talking about the Captain Cook statue that we have downtown Anchorage being handed over to the Eklutna Native tribe to make the sole decision on what the future of that would be, either leaving it up there and adding another statue next to it uh, that expands upon the Native culture and the history we have here in Alaska to outright, and, and this is something that they themselves have, have suggested. Um, or just outright just completely destroying it, get rid of, getting rid of it, it's racist. Um, and, and the same thing with the, the Seward statue uh, that was just put up, what, no more than maybe a year ago in Juneau. They're, they're talking about completely having that one removed because uh, it, it's also considered now under the current uh, nature of our, our uh, country is it's considered racist and, and uh, because they, they were slave owners and, and whatnot. Seward was that, that's think. what they're they're claiming he was uh, re one of the reasons why that they're they're removing a lot of these is, is because they they were slave owners in the past mm. it had nothing to do with their accomplishments or what they achieved in, in our history it, ha it has everything to do with this is that they own slaves um, and in the, or in, in Alaska's uh, nature that uh, Captain Cook was not who founded Alaska. The, the Clive tribe in Eklutna was here in Anchorage before he ever arrived. And the same thing with Seward. He was just an economic uh, type person that took advantage of the Russians and our, and our native culture and bought Russia, bought it from Russia. And Russia didn't really own it because it belonged to the Alaska natives. Yeah. Depends on whose interpretation you go by. I mean, there's a, I, I mean, I could go at it from the native angle. I could go at it from the other angle. I'm just describing what I'm constantly hearing out there. These are not my own opinions, I guarantee you that. No. <laughs> oh, I think this whole cancel culture, tear down the statue thing's pretty ridiculous. I guess the the statue, the Captain Cook statue belongs to the city of Anchorage? Uh, From my understanding, yeah. yes. Well, if that's the case, then I, I guess uh, elections have consequences and you all voted for Berkowitz, so your statue's probably getting torn down. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, he did hand it over to the the, the Eklutna tribe to decide what okay. to do with him. Yeah. Well. So, and, and and I do agree with with who I have seen written up about so far that they talked yeah. about just expanding, adding another statue, which bring more Alaskan heritage into the understanding of it. Well, at the end of the day, I think it's pretty silly, but uh, I don't see how it really impacts me if they're whatever they decide to do with some statue in Anchorage. <laughs> I mean, that's a. <laughs> Uh, do I think that that should be done? No, I, you know, those who ignore history, uh, I mean, you know, it's to their own detriment. So uh, even even if these these folks really were bad people, which I I would dispute, uh, you know, bad. Well, whatever. Bad for the time, or yeah, bad, bad for, for the now. time, or bad for now, or you know, you're we're judging them based upon present day uh, institutions and whatnot when when they maybe shouldn't be because of the time they lived in. But um, no, we shouldn't go and try to erase history or rewrite history. It uh, shouldn't be done. <laughs> And uh, let me see, we have, uh, well, I'm going to throw the ferries out here. I don't want to let you walk yeah. away without saying something about the ferry systems because it's a hot button every single year. It's a topic. You can't cut our ferries, can't cut our ferries, but you can't increase the fer ferries fees yeah. because that, that's just not right. But if you live in Bethel or you live in Barrow or uh, Yugotovic and uh, you, You've got to pay full fare for your airplane ticket to get there and back. Full fare to cover the prices of, of what it costs to ship things there. But if you live on the ferry system, we're going to state subsidize that cost of doing those exact same yep. things. Um, well, what, what again, would you suggest for the it, it ought to be uh, the fares pay for the ferries, uh, or at least uh, the cost of the ferries is what could be recouped out of fares. Um, 
So th somebody is always paying for all of these things. And if you are, if you are providing services that all in cost more than what any reasonable person would ever be willing to pay for it, you are destroying wealth. And there's no two ways around it. So if the ferries cannot be supported by fares, like if the cost of the ferry system would never be able to be recouped by charging for the service that they are providing, then they ought to be shut down. But I don't think that's the case. I think that they got some routes that are extraordinarily, uh, well, I wouldn't say unprofitable because we're talking about them just operating at a, you know, break even. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of those routes are not even providing the value to the people that are being serviced that is being expended. If you just gave them the money for the fares, they still wouldn't pay the fares if you charge the full fare. And so you shouldn't provide that. There's probably something else that a uh, better service that, that, that they're lacking that isn't being provided because we are spending money on these sort of things. So, yeah. And the, the, the couple of questions that I did not uh, talk with you earlier about if voted in <laughs> what would be your priorities to accomplish yeah so I uh, I want to cut the states hey ten minutes five about ten minutes more okay. and then we'll move everything back where they belong yeah um, so I think we need to cut the state spending, uh, shift responsibility for a lot of these services to local governments, um, and put our, our state on the same fiscal footing uh, going forward. Uh, I think if we don't do that now, uh, well, ultimately the, the expenditures are gonna match the revenues. It's just gonna be even more painful down the road and we'll have taxes and the permanent fund dividend will be gone forever. And I think we can, we have a chance right now to avoid that. And while we have our, you know, a Republican governor from the Valley in office, we got two years, let's get in there and let's do it. If you are elected, what bills would you push to be passed? So the um, constitutional budget cap, I think is extremely important. Um, other than that, are looking to work with people to cut the budget. And um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of good ideas out there that I've heard. I, I don't know that it has to be something that I sponsor. I mean, I think a lot of times if you're looking to get credit for things, then you're not gonna be as productive in promoting the things that actually need to be done. I don't care if I get credit for it or if, I. I just assume other people get credit for the things as long as they get done. So, yeah. And, and the one question that I know is not on my little tab here, and I'll leave this, and then uh, at that point I'm going to let you have parting remarks. Um, the, the the final question is is why should I vote for you over anybody else that is running out there for the same seat? Yeah. So I, I I hear a lot of language about go down and fight in Juno fight, 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 right? Well, I mean, in what way is it a fight? I've never seen anybody get punched on the floor. I've never seen, you know, they're not, they're not uh, dueling or anything like that. Um, what you need to do as a legislator is you need to go down there and convince. You need to convince 21 other people in the House that the way that you, you and your constituents want to go is the correct way. And I've never seen uh, uh, anybody be successful at convincing somebody to go one way when they start out by saying I'm opposed to everything that you stand for and and we're we're gonna fight you know right so if you have gone down and you've pissed off everybody on a personal level you're never gonna be able to convince them that you're right even if you are and I think that the, the social interaction um, is important. And you know, you can, you can find things uh, where, well actually, um, I <laughs> and I don't know if I should say this, but 
the people that want credit are are the are the easiest people to manipulate because if you if you find out what they want and usually if if, if it's credit for things well that's a fine thing to give them if you can get real results you can make them look like the winner you know make it look like their idea as long as it gets done who cares and um, you know so if you go down there and you try to find ways for people to look good like uh, some of these Anchorage Republicans you could say well we're gonna cut the budget and do this and that and you know the other thing and it's all your idea <laughs> or, or you know however this we can find a way to make this a political win for you then there's no harm in doing that I mean I don't want the credit I I would just assume they got the credit as long as we get it done and so that I would say that that'd be a good reason to vote for me because I am just results oriented I don't want to go down there and take credit for anything <laughs> I mean I'll take blame I if that helps it get done <laughs> but uh, yeah and I just want to get the results any parting remarks for everybody out there or I mean, uh, we, we've been going at it here pretty strong for almost a good couple hours now. No, I'm, I'm not a great public speaker or anything, but uh, um, if anybody has any questions, they can feel free to give me a, a call. Um, my cell phone number is 715-7388. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Jesse. Yeah. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. This is uh, Jesse Sumner running for uh, House District 10. And uh, I'm going to get to a closing. <laughs> all right. And I would like to thank everybody out there in Facebook land for joining us here today. And uh, our first candidate uh, session one-on-one, -on -one, ask the candidate a question. Don't hesitate to leave any comments that you have inside of the comment area. I'll do my best to roll through them a little later on and do some answering. Uh, maybe Jesse will be able to hop on to this particular feed and answer a few questions for you out there too. If, if he sees some that we didn't already answer in the video today. Again, Facebook squeals on you if you don't share, so don't forget to share. And for all of you guys out there in Facebook land, help us grow. Come to my website, politidic.com, click the donate link, and donate a couple of bucks. Help chip in. Let's take mainstream media on and expose what they don't want you to see. Thank you all. Have a great day.